Great. Thanks very much, Manolis. Um, well, it's great to be here. Um, UCL is in my family. My dad, in the 60s, studied at Birkbeck. Uh, and um, I ended up at UCL as well, at the ergonomics unit, as it was, on Bedford Way, uh, and learned my HCI from John Long. Some of you may or may not know John. Um, and that really got me into thinking about user-centered technology. And then when I moved to the Open University, to the Knowledge Media Institute, where Diana Lorillard hired me as part of the huge influx of learning technologists that she brought into the OU in 95. And I kind of grew up there as a researcher there in the Knowledge Media Institute. So it's great to be here. Uh, and uh, wandering the streets around here again was, was very nice. Um, today, I'm going to show you some developing ideas. Um, this work is not yet published in any formal way, but I'm trying to get feedback from people as to whether you think I'm getting at something important and moreover getting at it in a helpful way. So I very much value your feedback um, uh, today and I'm going to be around for the rest of this afternoon working with Manolis and his team as well around learning analytics. Um, so this is my provocation to, to get us going. Um, we have here a social network diagram. It doesn't matter what the tool is, but it's, it's drawing social ties that learners are forming with each other. Okay, we're not going to worry about how those ties are picked up at the moment or, uh, or, or whether we think that's necessarily a great visualization, but it's the sort of thing you see all the time now. Right? But uh, we have this student here who's clearly not very connected. And that would normally signal warning lights amongst the social network analysts and amongst potentially amongst educators who care about students and their social learning, their sense of belonging, their social capital. Um, but it turns, uh, and so the students, however, however, the student is not happy about this. You know, you, they're essentially saying, look, you might as well write a report somewhere that says that Fred's a bit of a loner. Um, you've just painted a picture instead. You know? And frankly, that's not true. You know? I, th I think I'm very sociable. Talk to the other students. You know? We're always talking about our, our studies. Um, and the university, let's imagine the university says, look, you know, don't panic. We're not picking you out in a malicious way or anything. Don't read too much into it. It's just the algorithm. Now, the algorithm is operating very well. But hopefully we would all agree that this is not an adequate response in a learning and teaching context. And so really what I want to try and do this afternoon is unpack in what sense is that an adequate analysis and an inadequate analysis. From whose perspectives would that be an adequate response? The answer would probably be a computer scientist who coded it. Right? But clearly, there's more at stake here than proving that the algorithm was correctly implemented. So just by way of context, um, I moved to UTS uh, to work with Shirley Alexander, who is the DVC for education and students there, uh, 18 months ago, 20 months ago now. And KIC, the Connected Intelligence Center, was created uh, to do applied R&D into uh, UTS. Our primary audience is UTS staff and students, researchers, educators, students, and the business units as well, in fact, to help them think more creatively about the way we use data and analytics in the university. But of course, we, we do applied research off the back of that, publish our work, etc. I'm here to speak about some of the work we do up in Edinburgh next week at the LAC conference. So that's what we do. And I'm going to talk about this, this algorithmic accountability concept uh, and what it might mean when we think about learning analytics. So the thought experiment then, you've actually seen a glimpse of it already. Here's another learning analytics system. It's showing a bunch of students and there is an algorithm that says as they progress through their course, we're going to give them a red, amber, green signal uh, traffic light depending on whether we think they're on track or not. All right. And these systems are becoming extremely popular. They've generated a lot of excitement. 
Um, there will probably be vendors pitching this to UCL as we speak because student retention, student engagement, keeping students on track has got lots of pound signs attached to it as well, of course. And of course, we don't want students to fail. You know, it's, it's our moral responsibility to do all we can to use the data available to us to give them as much constant feedback as possible. However, the student complains, because every time they log into whatever the LMS is, the system is putting up their signal and um, telling them they're at grave risk of, risk of failure. But the student has already informed the university about his or her situation. Right? Things aren't going well, but I'm working to catch up. The university knows about it. But, you know, the university says, don't worry, look, we know your situation. It's just the algorithm. Right. OK, and you've seen this one already. So the question is, what would it mean for a learning analytics system to be accountable? Uh, what are the criteria that we would use? And right now, there is actually you know, intense interest in the way that algorithms are pervading society. So if you do a Google search on news stories and look for the word algorithm, it's just everywhere, right? And this, of course, is provoking lots of intelligent kinds of discussion amongst people as to what does it mean when algorithms are pervading our lives increasingly. And we'll look at a few examples of that. Well, the first thing, of course, is that algorithms are not intrinsically evil, uh, and they can be used for all sorts of good. So if your baby was in intensive care right now, there might well be algorithms looking at the data streaming off those instruments and flagging more precisely in a more timely way when an irregularity is spotted. Right? And you know who's going to complain about that? A story here from one of our professors at UTS. The life force of big data. Um, <clears throat> When algorithms are working well and not overloaded with input, they normally help traffic get around the city. Right? Uh, and they're becoming increasingly adaptive because the feedback loops are becoming faster. And so as in every sector of society, we have a more and more close to real time picture of what's going on in the system, which is what you need when you want to try and manage a complex system. That's the excitement about analytics for learning. More and more feedback to different stakeholders about whether the ecosystem is healthy or not. Well, since I moved to Australia, I'm very glad that the guys who invented Skype invented TransferWise, because I can transfer pounds to Australian dollars at an extraordinarily good rate, because in fact, no money is leaving the country. I say I want to transfer N pounds to my bank in Australia and transfer-wise, do all sorts of clever things and find somebody who wants to transfer Australian dollars to the UK. And then they do internal transfers, right? Completely impossible without algorithms to accelerate the whole process. So I'm very happy with those ones. And there are lots of people saying, look, if, if big data is going to become a social good, it can't be the preserve of the corporate elites. It can't be the preserve of those who of the Googles and Microsofts of this world or the, uh, the big corporations. We need to use data and analytics for lots of social justice kinds of causes. And I just picked out one program here. For, and who could disagree with some of the agendas that you see on that slide? So before we get sort of critical and pessimistic, let's just remember that big data isn't about to go away anywhere. And algorithms can be used for all sorts of good as well. But it starts to get murkier. So here's a case, a story. It doesn't take long to find these, right? If you want to get credit, but you don't have any kind of banking information because of whatever your social circumstances are, a company will now mine your social media to figure out whether you're a high-risk person or not. Right? You spend your life tweeting and, and sharing on Facebook about the alcohol binges and overweightness and lack of sports you do and all these other high-risk behaviors, a health, a health company wants to know about that. Right?
Another typical worry story from the media is that uh, HR departments are starting to use algorithms to shortlist for interview. Okay. Um, and the argument, of course, is that, well, look, humans are biased. Humans have prejudices. Um, a machine can learn what are the features that you use to shortlist. So we'll get the machine to do it. Never gets bored, never complains, works 24-7. Uh, uh, it's not going to hire someone, but it's going to shortlist for you. Okay. And look, we can prove statistically the machine is as good as or even more consistent than humans in shortlisting. It's the same with essay grading. Might come to that later on. All right. Now, back in 2011, I gave a talk and stepped through a rather dystopic scenario where we're, we're hiring, in this case, students. We're trying to decide whether to accept students on a course. All right. So we might imagine, look, I was peering into the future in 2015. All right. Ali has applied to a study this course, but the data tells us they're new to study, low socioeconomics, England sec English as a second language, not strong ICT, and uh, <clears throat> his responses to this survey indicate a bit of a loner, not a collaborative learner, and that's known to be a bit of a, a handicap on this course. You could take them, but we reckon they're going to need a grade three tutor with at least... And our data tells them there's quite a high risk of dropout mid-course. No. Shall we take this student? Is it responsible to take this student? Is it responsible to take this student knowing that we can't actually offer him the support that all the evidence suggests he's going to need? Is it responsible to close down that opportunity to this student? Statistically, He's at risk. But he's an individual. He's got aspirations. Who's going to make the decision? Now, um, the interesting thing is that situations like this are no longer sort of entirely theoretical at all. Most universities haven't got this kind of level of intelligent support yet, if you want to use the word intelligent. However, Sadly, for example, uh, there was a story in The Guardian back in, in 88. Well, it was, in the, it was covered in the BMJ, and then it was covered in The Guardian subsequently. Again, another story about algorithms. Okay? This time, a university trained a machine to streamline applications for its admissions. And it did a brilliant job. It was just as good as humans. Unfortunately, what it did was replicate systematic gender and racial discrimination. All right? So it met the gold standard. It was as good as humans. Sadly, that, that was biased. Okay. So these are sort of examples of how analytics and algorithms are starting to infiltrate the academy just as they are other kinds of organizations. Provoking lots of good, healthy discussion. So if you go to govern governingalgorithms.org, for example, um, fantastic set of resources there. All the conference talks are on video. Um, a great provocation piece was written to, to kick the conference off, asking, what does it mean to govern algorithms? The algorithms are increasingly governing us. What does it mean to govern the algorithms? So I, I recommend that conference. Um, one of the speakers uh, was Frank Pascali. He's written a book called The Black Box Society, which is pretty scary reading. Uh, he gave a talk at LSE not long ago, in fact. Uh, let's get have a look at that. Um, about the way that algorithms are being used by financial institutions. And so the hashtag algorithmic accountability has become one of those places to track this kind of thinking. And that's what provoked me to think, OK, what does this mean in education? All right. We're not interested in financial institutions. We're not interested in HR recruitment programs. We are interested in learning, and we are interested in what the impact of algorithms are going to be. 
algorithmic accountability has you know, at least two meanings. Okay? One is algorithms that make you accountable. In other words, using algorithms instead of human judgment. Because machines could be more objective, efficient, and um, uh, uh, able to do it more precisely, more consistently than humans. Okay? Lots of things computers do are more consistent, more objective, and more efficient than humans. Right? So that's one sense. So whether, you know, be, where being made accountable means everything from are you credit worthy, are you worth hiring, are you at risk as a student, how are you doing in your studies at the moment, okay? whatever accountable means. But the other important meaning, of course, is how do we make those algorithms accountable? What does it mean to call an algorithm to account? Whose door are you going to knock on? What are you going to see when you ask to see the algorithm? Will you understand what you're looking at even if they show you? Okay? These are the kinds of questions we need to unpack. So Frank Pasquale argues, you know, sensibly enough, that in the black box society, we have to be able to open the box and look inside. And there's a whole bunch of people who have a view about what it means to look inside the box. It's a very transdisciplinary, exciting space to be in. Accountable, of course, in the extreme, could mean the lawyers are in the picture. But it doesn't necessarily have to get that bad. But it, it is, in some cases. So, universities could be using algorithms right now, and many of them may well be in their finance department, in your business operations department. You know, universities are huge organizations which bear many similarities to other corporations. And they will be using the kinds of tools available to business intelligence teams right now. Well, that's all well and good. But of course, um, we're interested in learning, which isn't the same as processing transactions or shipping products or deciding whether you get credit or not. Learning is different. And we have to have ways of asking our own institutions and our own researchers what does it mean to critique these things and the systems that they are driving. And given that, in theory, we are people who understand what really good learning and teaching look like, when you start applying algorithms into that space, what are we talking about? What are the implications? Um, this is part, I will argue, this is part of what the learning analytics field has to be engaging with. And as mentioned, um, solar is, is one of the places where we're trying to elevate the level of discourse that's going on around, around data and analytics. OK. Here's a picture to try and clarify what we're going to do now. I was thinking, okay, what, when you say learning analytics system, what are we talking about? <clears throat> there may or may not be some foundation in educational research. Let's imagine there is. Okay, so there are people, they've been around a lot longer than learning analytics, who study learning. Um, they may be in the learning sciences, they may be in educational research, you know, there are all these different camps, right? And there are learning theories and pedagogical frameworks, and assessment regimes, and instructional design. And some learning analytics, learning analytics systems are based on those sorts of constructs and frameworks. Along comes a learning analytics researcher and says, oh, that's really interested. I'm really interested in social learning. So I'm going to check. I'm going to use a particular framework for social learning, say, that a particular educational theorist has developed. And moreover, I think I can identify behaviors that make sense within that person's worldview that a machine could pick up. Right? When the students engage in this kind of behavior, because that is our window into the mind of the student, then I think that looks awfully like you know, making, uh, questioning an assumption, or connecting two two colleagues who aren't talking to each other, or uh, asking a trivial question, or 
failing persistently to pass a particular assessment. Yeah. Whatever that behavior is, I can pick it up automatically. I'm going to plug it into an algorithm which I claim is based on this worldview. And I'm going to give it to a coder who's going to produce running code on some kind of platform, generating data, and a user interface of some sort. Okay. Well, then we want to ask, well, okay, who's going to see the analytics? Well, for example, educators, of course, are crying out for new ways of seeing what's going on with their students. And moreover, depending again on your approach, the students might be seeing the data themselves. I'll make all these slides available afterwards, by the way, so don't worry if you're not getting all this. Okay, so the learners and educators are engaging with the system. And... Um, Somewhere along the line, we might hope there are some ethical principles in play. It may be implicit, or it might be explicit. Okay, now, that's a simple kind of view, but that, you know, there's no, there's no learning analytic system without at least somebody creating an algorithm based on some view of what learning is, somebody then coding it, producing a running system, and somebody engaging with it, right? It might be more or less grounded in theory. It may be more or less appealing to any ethical principles. So we can then say, okay, that's, there's, there's, there's our ecosystem, there's our stakeholders, and the kinds of artifacts they're producing en route. Now, we could start to ask questions. What's the relationship between the theory and the algorithm? What's the relationship between the algorithm and the code that actually got written? What's the experience of the end user, whoever that might be? To what extent do the learning outcomes or educational insights bear any resemblance to what this person thought they were doing when they wrote that theory or framework? And we might bring ethical principles to bear and ask, well, how should we see what's going on as the outcome of this system in relation to ethical principles, or what would those ethical principles be? All right. So what we're going to do is unpack this. We're going to go around the diagram and look at which kinds of people bring which kinds of intellectual apparatus to examine these, social, these accountability ties, these relationships. And there are more than I put up there. It's just to give you a sense of where we're going. All right. So I'm going to propose, given that I come from HCI, that there's a whole range of rather useful lenses we can bring to think about a human-centered design approach to these kinds of systems. One is ethics of technology, right? There are whole conferences and journals devoted to the ethics of technology. Uh, been around a long time. They have a well-developed set of intellectual tools for interrogating technological artifacts. Computer science, obviously. We can't, we can't be talking about software systems without involving the people who build those things and theorize them. Data science, because we're talking a lot about a lot of data, increasingly. There is an emerging field to sort of, it's a, it's, a bit, it's a bit like HCI, but it's focusing specifically on the data interaction with humans. User-centered design, would be a familiar concept, of course. And obviously, learning technology. We are talking about learning technologies, after all. And should any of this actually get to court, or be required to be put into codes of practice, then the lawyers may be involved. But the lawyers need frameworks. They need clues as to how to assess and put together a case that makes sense. Or they're just going to make up something else that we'll all be deeply unhappy with. So conceivably, if we were to think about legal accountability, things have got that bad we would want to propose that they're drawing on the kinds of insights that these different communities have. All right, so let's start with ethics. Um, I've drawn a couple of lines here, which um, make sense, asking about potentially what kinds of ethical thinking or implications there might be in a learning theory, right? Because a learning theory that might then lead to pedagogical practices that then lead to assessment regimes are making commitments, obviously. 
epistemological commitments. What kinds of agents and entities and learning are we interested in? Um, and uh, we, we wrote a paper all trying to ensure that anyone thinking about learning analytics is positioning what they're doing within the sort of triangle of epistemology, pedagogy, and assessment regimes. You cannot escape that triangle. You are always located in that triangle somewhere, whether or not you're aware of it. And of course, you know, if a system is actually having bad effects on the people using it, ethics would have something to say about that. OK. Again, I've put a citation here to, to one sort of helpful piece. But as I say, there are a whole, there's a whole community devoted to ethics of technology. But there was a paper here called Toward an Ethics of Algorithms. Right? And that author, amongst many things, Anani, talks about the deontological critique, where you ask of a system, is it producing results that satisfy the way we currently understand the world? Right? So you might be asking, is this system violating our data protection policy? Or you might be asking, is this system producing results that correspond with what educators think a good learner looks like? Right? So we take our current worldview and we say, does the system fit with that? There is a teleological critique which says, well, maybe it's producing new kinds of consequences that we've never seen before. But do, are they good things? Right? Technology has actually transformed what is possible. So our old worldview may not necessarily be adequate yet. But do we value and want to encourage the, the impacts it's having? And then there is another one called a virtues critique, which says, OK, well, putting those aside, we could ask, what are the designers trying to do here? Right? What values were they folding into the design at every level? So value-sensitive design looks at an infrastructure from the low level all the way up to the high. And moreover, what do the stakeholders and the users of the system think is going on? Right? What's the experience of using this technology? And I put a background reference there to claims analysis, which if you have an HCI background, you know the work of Jack Carroll and Mary Beth Rosson, you'll be familiar with. And we've, we've got a, a chapter in the handbook for, of learning analytics, which takes a claims analysis approach to learning analytics. What claims does this system seem to be making about learning, implicit in its design and its affordances? OK, so that's the ethics of technology. Back to our black box, briefly. Um, Pascali argues you know, that we need to look in the black box. But if you were to look in the black box, what would you see? So this begs our question, well, what is an algorithm anyway? Okay. Uh, an algorithm is not just running code. Right? An algorithm is actually a set of abstract rules for transforming data, information. It's the sort of thing you, that a mathematician or a computer scientist could write down on the blackboard, on the whiteboard, as an expression. It says, here's the algorithm to do this. But that's just going to sit on a whiteboard. It's not going to change the world until you do a number of things. Someone's got to actually implement that on certain kinds of data structures. You can't get away from hardware. right? It's going to be running on a platform of some sort that affects its performance, its timeliness. And um, it starts to get very complicated nowadays because it's not just somebody's a box sitting in one room. right? Our platforms are spread all over the world. Okay. So why are algorithms so hard to understand sometimes? What makes them opaque? There's another reference there to Burrell. Well, opacity happens for a number of reasons. One is, that algorithm is my IP, and I'm not telling you how it works. That's my competitive edge. Right? Now, we can either throw our hands up in horror and say, well, that's, you know, everything should be open. Right? But we are, of course, in the process asking, 
at that point, well, do we not want innovation? Do we not want all of these startup companies to be working to try and improve things? Uh, and you can't necessarily expect everyone just to publish all their IP. Right? So we could have a debate about open source at that point. But there is clearly intentional secrecy around a lot of this. So frankly, if you ask, you won't get anywhere. Even if I showed you, you might not understand what you're looking at. Okay? Uh, you've got to be a computer scientist or a mathematician to understand some of these things. And as I've said, the complexity of the infrastructure is, 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 uh, um, is great nowadays. You can't just go and look in one box or one piece of running code. And I should have said uh, that the previous uh, slide um, is, is a summary from Paul Durish's uh, recent talk in Melbourne, The Social Lives of Algorithms. <clears throat> he summarizes very nicely there, you know, to, uh, the, the, the differences between an algorithm just per se and what's actually needed to get that making an, an impact on, on the world. Okay, so back to the black box. <clears throat> so if we take Paul Durish's argument seriously and, and, and arguments made by many others, the fact that these algorithms are hard to pin down means that the notion of looking inside the black box is a really a very complicated matter. Right? Uh, and Durish argues, for example, that we need to be studying how these abstractions and algorithms come to be. How do they get created? You know, when there's a team scribbling on the whiteboard saying, how are we going to do this? Who are those people? How much about learning do they understand, we might ask? Um, and we need to, we, you know, so that, that's a whole new field for social scientists opening up here. How is it that people come up with these abstractions and these procedures? Okay. So computer science gives us insights into these accountability relationships. Someone's come up with an algorithm. Has it actually been implemented to behave as the algorithm uh, suggested it should be? Of course, they're also creating data, and they're creating user interfaces. And moreover, we've added a few characters down in the bottom right here, because these are other programmers who might be interested to look in the box. Can they see that code? How easy is it to see? So computer scientists would talk about algorithmic integrity. Does the code implement it? Can you reverse engineer it? Can I see the source code? Can I maintain the source code? Can I modify it and understand how the system's going to behave? Um, can we understand why the system is behaving it the way it is just from its behavior? Right? Even if I can't see the source code, can I infer what's going on by testing it? Right? By changing the conditions and seeing what happens. Okay. Back to our algorithmic recruitment. So Solon Barocas is one of the <clears throat> leading thinkers in this, in the States. He's a data mining, machine learning guy, but thinking deeply about ethics. One of the guys who convened the Governing Algorithms Conference. And he submitted written testimony to the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Given that algorithms are starting to pervade employment law, many companies are arguing that they're objective, rigorous, blah de blah de blah, right? And Barocas uh, launches a broadside at this naive view that algorithms uh, are neutral or objective in some sense. Okay. They could inherit the prejudices of prior decision makers. They could actually simply mirror pre-existing patterns of exclusion and inequality. They could systematically continue to deny disadvantaged and vulnerable groups, which is what employment law is all supposed to be about, uh, protecting. Um, and it can be very hard to figure out what's going on should something go to court. Brilliant piece of writing there due to appear in... Uh, uh, in um, California Law Review. So in terms of data science, Barocas is certainly talking about, well, what is this algorithm and where did it come from? <coughs> I should have put a line in there to the ethics. And, I should, and, and what I've added in here is he talks a lot about the training data that's used for machine classification. 
and whether that training data is biased in different ways. So just to unpack it a little bit more formally, here's the link to his paper uh, for California Law Review at the bottom. He talks about whether the training set you've used, where, where you give a machine n hundred or thousand examples of, you know, for example, uh, a highly employable candidate, or in, in learning analytics, here are 500 examples of outstanding writing, and here are 500 examples of failure writing. Okay. But training sets can embody bias. They may be selected from certain easily accessible sources, which build bias into them. Um, when you're trying to predict something, he asks, does, that, does the selection of those target variables and the labels you're using for them, does that actually embody discriminatory bias of some sort? Are you focusing only on certain kinds of variables that will systematically bias you against ethnic minorities? Will your language technologies systematically bias the performance of the system against students for whom English is a second language, for example? I might come back to that one later when I give an example of that. All right. He talks about feature selection integrity. This is really about um, uh, requisite variety. All right. We're dealing with complex phenomena, and you're focusing on a certain number of features that the machine can reason about. Well, what have you thrown away in the process? Often we throw away context, outliers, other things that the machine doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, there is something like called proxy features in machine learning where you can't actually get at the data you need, so you choose another data set that you believe to be strongly correlated with the data you wish you could have had. Because that's all you've got to work on. But that comes with big risks as well. Okay. So a very nice piece of work by Barakas himself. So there's a data science critique. Right? These are the kinds of things that, that we would hope to get from, from that perspective. Human data interaction asks, what happens when many learners are interacting with each other, generating data sets? Um, you've got learning analytics researchers who may have some sense of ownership about the data as well. Who gets access to that? So work by Crabtree and Mortier um, I, uh, here in the UK. Um, they're talking about human data interaction. And they're asking questions like, within your infrastructure, what are the protocols to access personal data? So they are, they're not writing in the context of learning per se. They're just talking about big data. Your personal data is out there all over the place. right? You've given it away to the supermarket to the online stores, to all sorts of people. Uh, in the future, maybe you would have more control over who got to access your data. What would it look like to have a really clear protocol when a company wanted to access your data and you could give permission or deny? Could that even be technically possible? Well, there are people working on that. Um, uh, how do you hold a social data infrastructure to account? Given that many kinds of data are produced through interaction, not just from my action, but my interaction with you, if somebody wanted to access that data, how do we collectively give permission for that to happen? And agency. You know, again, it's another, another version of how do citizens have control over access? And can they even, what does it mean to give informed consent? Right? When we, are, as, as learning analytics researchers, ask for informed consent from participants, Part of the point of data science is that you can do all sorts of exciting analyses on that data that become, it becomes, uh, you realize it becomes important later on, but you didn't know what you wanted to do at the beginning. So all the rules may have to change about what it means to give informed consent. And even if you explain to a student or a citizen what might happen to their data, again, would they really understand? Because it's quite technical stuff. Lots of unknown answers there. OK, let's think about user-centered design. I'm going to pick this up because uh, time's going on. Well, I think we all know what user-centered design is. And the question is, to what extent are those stakeholders involved in, in the design process? And how late do they come in? Or how early do they come in? And of course, we're interested in what happens in terms, just in terms of the usability of the system. Uh, but not just usability, because HCI has moved on way beyond 
usability and the efficiency of performing tasks to the emotional experience of using this uh, and, and other less sort of tasky cognitive psychology type questions that one might ask of performing a task. So, again, probably not many surprises here. Who's supposed to be using this system and can they engage in the right kinds of sense making when they see a visualization pop up? If a user wants to know why the system's behaving as it is, how might it explain itself? Um, Amazon will tell you why it's recommending you six-year-old's books, and you can dismiss its recommendations if you can be bothered to, right? Because, yes, six months ago you bought your nephew a book, but you don't want constant barrage of recommendations about six-year-old's books. Uh, the open learning models work that... Uh, uh, in the AI ed field, where it tries to explain to a user in non-technical language what's going on inside the black box. And participatory design techniques, of course, are used to try and involve stakeholders in appropriate ways at appropriate times in that design process. Okay. Our, our final perspective is the learning sciences and educational technology. This will look should look very familiar to you uh, as a field. I've drawn in some of those lines there. You know, what is the relationship between the data that this system is generating and the, the inspiration for that work back here? What is the relationship between that theory or framework and the algorithm? What is the relationship to the learning outcomes and the educational insights? So, you know, if, if you want to get a paper published, a good move, a good academic thing to do, is to explain how your technology is thoroughly grounded in one or more well-theorized, well-published educational worldviews. Right? I didn't just dream this up in my garage. This is grounded in all that's the kind of stuff every PhD student will have to do, etc. Now, it's interesting to ask, has anybody ever gone back to those original academics and said, did you know people are building all sorts of systems based on the community of inquiry model, or your particular social constructivist model. You know, some of these academics are involved in this world. Some of them are not. Some of them might be horrified to know what people are doing in their name in terms of building systems, right? So this is all just part of what happens when you have different communities starting to cross talk, but the people don't necessarily know each other. These are the the exciting spaces where different perspectives come together when you could actually involve that, that research community. And this is some of the work that we've been trying to do in the learning analytics communities to, to connect researchers who know a lot about online discourse, say, with natural language processing technologies down here. Okay, so those are the kinds of questions that we would expect them to be asking. It's not just about the computer scientist says, did you implement that algorithm with integrity in running code? A learning scientist or educational researcher is asking, does that algorithm, indeed the whole system, have integrity with respect to those ideas? Have you sort of bastardized it in some process? Uh, by the time you get to the end, this doesn't look anything like the kind of learning I wrote my, my framework or methodology to support, but you're using my work. Uh, as, a, as an appeal, as a warrant. Well, obviously, have we improved learning? And obviously, have we improved teaching? Um, and conceptual integrity um, is the data that, you know, if that data says this learner is showing a lot of agency, or this learner is clearly very curious, well, do we have other sources of data that would, we can triangulate with? Okay, so that's the end of walking around that, that system and looking at some of those accountability ties. I'm now just going to step through two examples uh, to ground it a little further, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, so next week we're going to be presenting a paper um, uh, at, at the LAC conference which talks about can we imagine machines giving feedback on reflective writing? Okay. Not essay writing, 
analytical, scholarly, academic essay writing where your job is to demonstrate your mastery of a particular topic within a certain number of words in response to a particular trigger question, perhaps. Right. But where I am disclosing to you my own uncertainties as a learner, the questions I'm asking about what I'm learning, often based on some kind of authentic experience in the workplace or you know, somewhere where I'm, I'm not necessarily, I, c I can't be observed because I'm out there in the real world doing stuff, which is, of course, what we want our students to be doing often. But now I'm sitting down, I'm trying to make sense of what I'm learning, what I feel went well, what, my, what I think my inadequacies were, how I'm going to improve on them, and so forth. Very different genre of writing. But an amazing window onto the mind of a transformative experience for some students. So here are a couple of screenshots from a system that we're developing at the moment, which is trying to pick up on the kinds of language that are used in, in deep rather than superficial uh, reflective writing. As a person, I've learned that at 19 years old, I'm not ready to work full-time indefinitely. Well, there's an honest admission. All right. um, and the system is tagging that as, well done, that's a specific reflection. You didn't just say, I learned an awful lot on this placement or that meeting me really made me think. It's a specific reflection. I've learned something specific, right? But, you know, they could have been, they could have said more. They could have added examples or justified it in some way. I felt as if it was, uh, I'll give you another example. We'll use this one, okay? From nursing, in particular, it prompted me to question to what extent I as a nurse should recommend analgesia, drawing on what I've been taught about the effective control of pain. Good reflection. Right. This woman's been in the field working with, I think it was, elderly patients. Right. And they are talking about what they're learning in class, the syllabus. They're, it's a specific reflection. It, it, for, it prompted me to question something specific. And there's been a shift, a shift in my awareness or perception of some sort. This is what we want to see in our students. Right. My worldview is changing. That's why we do this, right? We want them to walk out thinking differently, seeing the world differently, feeling differently about themselves, holding their knowledge more loosely because they're aware it's only partial. Okay, now, this isn't a talk about the details of this system, but let's imagine that this is now deployed as it will be by the end of this year at UTS. Okay. It's based on rubrics for good reflective writing, which are gradually formalized for the NLP platform so that we can define machine processable patterns for what a particular, in this case, shift in my sense of capability means. Okay, we won't go into the details of that. And we do different kinds of validation. Here's the human analy analyzing the corpus. Here's the machine extracting the sentences it thinks are non-trivial reflection. And we would, do, we, would, we would be asking, well, how many times does the machine get it right? How many times does it get it wrong? And then we can con calculate confusion matrices to look at the true positives and the false positives and so forth. Okay. Never mind the detail, but if we were to bring to bear the armory of lenses that we've just been looking at, what kinds of questions would be asking of this system? Well, you remember the ethics approach. The one of the questions was, does the system do what we currently judge to be good writing? Does it spot the same things? Right. This is a system that can do something that no human can do at scale, which is give instant feedback 24 hours a day on draft writing. Right? We haven't got a human tutoring capability to give every student instant feedback on their drafts. That's a new kind of thing we've never seen before. Is that good? Does it lead to better student writing, better understandings of writing, more engaged students who enjoy writing now, whereas before they didn't? Or is it in fact damaging? Right? So language technology that understands human writing is extraordinarily controversial. Some academics don't want to go anywhere near it. You know? There's a huge debate amongst the automated essay evaluation community 
on one sand and the scholars and writers and educators of writing on the other, many of whom do not want any of this technology near their students. Right? But it's coming. And in the recent handbook on automated essay evaluation, um, the, 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 the introduction was written by somebody from the writing composition and education camp saying, I felt a bit nervous being asked to write the introduction to this book from all these computer scientists. You know, my career could be at an end at this point. But they, they walk an interesting tightrope saying, there are lots of important questions we have to ask of this technology, but sticking our heads in the sand and saying, this is never going to come near my students is not one of the legitimate answers. This technology is coming, so let's make sure it's doing what we think it should be doing. All right. Okay, if we step through some of the other lenses then, the computer scientist would be saying, did that platform pick up the linguistic features that it was supposed to pick up? The data scientist would say, do those features actually have the discriminatory power to differ differentiate good from poor writing? Are we ignoring some important qualities that uh, we can't pick up yet? Do they bias against certain kinds of student? Right? So right now, the system does need some pretty well-constructed well English. So what do we do with our students who have got poor English? Do we simply tell them, sorry, you can't benefit from this system? We can talk about that later. We're thinking about how we do this. The HDI perspective is, for example, our students consenting to their writing being analysed. Right? The university is asking them to do something that, and, and engage with a system that they wouldn't normally engage with. What's the value proposition there? User-centred design, how do you involve students and educators in building a system like this? Well, we talk about that in the paper. Learning technologists, of course, well, where have these rules come from? Who said that's a, that's a feature of good, deep, reflective writing? Does the algorithm implement the rubric in this case? It wasn't a theory, it was more of a rubric with integrity. And what do educators or students think about this technology? Okay, so, um, and you know, should this actually go to court, could a student sue the university and say, your system told me I'd done some pretty good work in my draft and you've just given me a bare pass, right? So, there are all sorts of ways of trying to control for a situation like that as well. We can talk about that. Okay. Number two is the social network example I opened with. Okay. So, there we have a tool which is harvesting, harvesting activity across multiple social media platforms outside of the LMS. It's quite an exciting concept. It's a project called Beyond the LMS, led by Kirsty Quito at Queensland University of Technology, Beyond, beyondlms.org. We, you know, just because you're, you're sending your students off out into the wild to use different web tools, they don't know, have to be off the radar now. We can aggregate that data back into um, using the Experience API protocol. Okay, so never mind the detail, but you're building social networks of students' social ties. Again, without reading all the way through, you can see the kinds of questions we might bring to bear from the different lenses, as I've discussed. And this is the answer to the question, in what sense was that opening slide inadequate? Because it was really only dealing with that, the computer science perspective as to whether you know, it's just the algorithm is only one of a whole range of responses that we should be having when we're starting to critique these kinds of systems. All right. So, wrapping up, we are already trusting algorithms with our lives. I climbed off a plane from Sydney yesterday morning, having trusted lots of algorithms to process lots of data to get me here in one piece. All right? But transparency is a complex issue. You do not understand all the algorithms in your life already. Um, we trust trained professionals to explain to us why your car engine is doing this why you got that stupid letter from the bank when it, you shouldn't have, why your credit card just got stopped when you haven't been behaving like a terrorist or a thief or a fraudster, right? The companies do 
do have people who understand these things most of the time. In fact, many credit card companies cannot tell you why the card got stopped. It's just the algorithm. It's basically what they tell you. All right. But the point is, the algorithm is not the answer to the question on its own. We need to really step back and think about it in a much more holistic sense. And I've talked a little bit more about this as well, and about the white rabbit that pops out of the black hat in this case, rather than the black box, uh, in an article in, in Medium. And so to conclude, we might say, well, what does the discipline look like in five or ten years' time? Well, I think we're talking about a new kind of educational professional who can talk those kinds of languages or teams of professionals. But together, they can cover those bases. I think we're talking about a way of auditing learning analytics at different levels from multiple perspectives. Right? The computer scientist has got a very important question to answer, but it's not the only question, it's not the only perspective, and it's only at one level in the system. We need these kinds of principles not only to audit and hold existing systems to account, but hopefully to guide their design before they ever see the light of day. Right? So in academic peer review, maybe in the future, Lack will be wanting to see authors dealing with some of these issues. And so maybe we are moving from algorithmic accountability to a more holistic concept, which for the moment I'm calling analytic system integrity. As a systems perspective, um, it's to do with integrity, which to me is a broader concept which connects us to ethics and outcomes and, and values, as well as, which includes, but is not restricted to just algorithmic accountability. Okay, I better shut up at that point, but we can have some Q&A or go out for coffee, so thanks very much.